Hi, I'm Phil Harwell, and this is my 63rd video discussing British science fiction. As the 1960s progressed, having ceased creating comic strips, I became entirely involved in written science fiction. Eventually self-publishing my fern bibliography is a duplicated fanzine in 1963. John Russell Fern, an evaluation. In 1965, after I'd received copies of Fern's correspondence with author William F. Temple, I greatly expanded it as John Russell Fern, The Ultimate Analysis. And then finally, after my mother had loaned me the money, a nicely printed further revised edition in 1968, retitled as The Multiman. The Multiman received some good reviews and came to the attention of Ron Graham in Australia. A very successful businessman, having built up a group of mining and engineering companies in New South Wales, Ron Graham was also a lifelong collector of science fiction and a great fan of John Russell Fern and British science fiction authors. On the strength of my published uh, writings on Fern and also on AC Tub, he approached me to act as editor and director of a new publishing company to be set up in England. This fact was recorded in Walter Gilling's magazine, Science Fantasy Review. Let's just see here. Bear with me. My brief was to return the best novels of John Russell Fern to print and to create and edit a new monthly British science fiction magazine, Vision of Tomorrow. The magazine was to publish new fiction only, of which up to 40% could be by Australian authors, 10% by European authors, but no stories at all by American authors, whom Graham had banned. And there's an advertisement in the magazine. There we are. That was the proposed programme of the new publishing company. And there is the, the new magazine when it was published, Vision of Tomorrow. In 1969, after discussing the offer with my fiance, I threw over my local government career. I was then working as assistant registrar at a new technical college in Walls End to launch what was then Britain's only national magazine, National Professional Science Fiction Magazine. My fiancée also resigned her own job at the same college to work as my secretary. Vision's lifetime, July 1969 to September 1970, extended only over 12 issues before I resigned in unhappy circumstances. Because it pains me so much, I don't propose to say much more about the magazine in these videos and why it ended. But I've already given a detailed account of what happened in my book, Vultures of the Void, The Legacy, which is still available from Amazon. There's a full, full detailed account of the trials and tribulations of the magazine, and why I resigned, and why the magazine came to an end. Full details are given in the book, so I don't propose to go over them in this video. There's uh, Ron Graham himself and some of the Australian contributors. That's artist Stanley Pitt and authors Damien Broderick, Jack Wadhams, David Rome, 
And I had an assistant editor as well, John Bangsland. And you will see a few of the magazines. Also, I gave a full account in Mike Ashley's book, Transformations, the story of the science fiction magazines from 1950 to 1970. Mike printed extracts from a full memoir about the magazine. So all the details of the magazine's history are in that book. But in retrospect, I guess I can take some satisfaction from these 12 issues. From its pages would be picked up many stories for world's best and best of year annual anthologies, and several authors and artists to whom I gave early career breaks went on to become internationally known. Vision's first cover was painted by my father from my design, and thereafter there were covers by Gerald Quinn. That's another Quinn. Eddie Jones. Three, four. That's Eddie. And that's Eddie Jones at the bottom there. And that's Eddie Jones' last cover. Then there was a famous astronomical artist, David Hardy. You see his first cover there. Another cover by David Hardy. A young artist called Kevin Cullen did that cover. And lastly, Australian artist Stanley Pitt did that one. And this one also. Now, Vision's authors included uh, William F. Temple, Philip E. High, and Sidney J. Bounds, other authors included Michael J. Corney, Michael J. Corney, and there we see Christopher Priest, nowadays a very famous author, the story by Christopher Priest. Michael Moorcock, that was his story on the cover, another British author was Bob Shaw, well known author nowadays, Bertram Chandler, very famous Australian author, he's actually British born, but he was a naturalised Australian. That story won an Australian award, it's the best story of the year, I think. And what else do we have? Lee Harding, leading Australian contributor. Eddie Jones did most of the artwork. That's Eddie Jones. John Brunner, another well known author.
John Russell Fern was the number of uh, the all new stories that were posthumously published. John Russell Fern stories. That's another one. Feather straight down the cover. And perhaps the most notable author was E.C. Tubb, who I've talked about lots of times in these videos. Bear with me. Page 35. You will see a story which was specially commissioned, Lucifer, illustrated by Gerard Quinn, well-known artist who'd worked for New World and the Cornell magazines. Now, Lucifer is a very noted story. It won the Best European Short Story of the Year Prize at an International SF Festival in Trieste, and it's been constantly reprinted worldwide ever since. Most notably, in this best-selling anthology edited by Stephen King, no less, and Bev Vincent. Yes. Stephen King's introduction to the story. Talking about Tub. And this story is the basis for a new $9 million American film starring Morgan Freeman, which is coming out this autumn. So that's something to watch out for. Another noted feature of the magazine was a regular series, The Impatient Dreamers, which told the story, the history of British science fiction, with the famous, by the famous editors, Walter Gillings, pioneering editor Walter Gillings, vintage magazines there, which he's discussing. And also the other famous British editor, pioneering editor, John Cornell. Telling the inside story of the birth of New Worlds magazine. Now my grim experiences with the publishing world left me bruised and emotionally shattered and completely disrupted my life. Following my resignation, I was now out of work and being only recently married with a substantial mortgage, I could have been in real trouble. But incredibly, what saved me was my misspent youth when I'd spent years transcribing the Radio Luxembourg down there stories into my own comic books. This self-taught talent for listening to the spoken word and then writing it up afterwards in an edited version was exactly the skill I needed to begin an entirely new career in local government. I managed to find new employment with the Time House Borough Council working for the Director of Education, writing council reports and minuting the Education Committee meetings. After three years, I had enough committee experience to gain a better job with another neighbouring council, now working in their town clerk's department, initially in Seton Delaval and later in Blythe. But my brief publishing career had not been entirely wasted. My familiarity with author and publishing contracts now came in useful for my later work on all kinds of municipal legal contracts and agreements for the council, alongside my work on committees and council meetings. And although I did note at the time, my youthful obsession with creating comic strips would also prove to be of immense and life-changing benefit 
many years later. Now over here we see that from 1974, outside of my full-time job with the council, I also acted as the literary agent for many years for anthologist Mike Ashley, whose very first series, The History of the Science Fiction magazine, was sold in New English Library Limited, a four book series, and then in translation in America, and in Spain, and in Italy. I acted for Ashley on many more books, some of which we see here. lots more anthologies I did with Mike Ashley and I would have done many more but unfortunately my wife fell seriously ill and was hospitalized. She very nearly died. Our daughter had been born in 1972 and I was now virtually a single parent. With an increasingly demanding job in local government I had to give up all my outside aging activities, with the sole exception of John Russell Fern. I had to stop being the agent for my Ashley and some other people. I was too stable. Now, to concentrate entirely on John Russell Fern. I was acting for Fern's widow, Carrie. I had numerous novels and stories reprinted, many in European translations. Here we see just a few of the dozens of Italian editions. Carrie Fern would sadly die in 1982 when I learned she'd bequeathed me all of Fern's copyrights in her will. This inheritance would eventually reshape my life. Now at that time, I was not part of comics fandom, having long, si long since switched my attention to books and magazines, although I still keenly followed comic strips in national newspapers such as Garth and Jeff Hawke. But in November 1980, many months after its publication, I came across an intriguing fanzine, Golden Fun number 11, quite by chance in a second-hand bookshop near the Newcastle Quayside. It was packed with scholarly articles by UK comics enthusiasts, and its lead cover featured article was devoted to artist Ron Turner, Intrigued, I bought the issue. In it, I found that a long-time fan, John Lawrence, had decided that Ron Turner deserved some recognition for all his marvellous comics work, and he'd written a long article of appreciation. I was amazed to discover that my favourite science fiction book cover artist of the Mushroom Era had been enjoying an equally impressive parallel career in the comics medium. It's just a few of the hundreds of comics and you can see the standard of his artwork it was superb. Walk 
comics. Just for space comics. Right random. Classic science fiction. See another war comic there. And we've seen those ones before in an earlier video. I showed you the Titbits science fiction series. And Turner was also famous for Space Ace. His own strip. Space Ace. So this was a new discovery for me. I knew nothing about them until I read all about them in John's article. I've been completely unaware of Turner's comics credentials. And judging by his article in Golden Fun, John Lawrence was himself unaware of the extent of Turner's book career. Via the editor, Alan Clark, to whom I immediately sent a subscription, That's the, the fanzine, Golden Fun, packed with information on vintage comics. Quickly subscribe to it. I contacted the editor, explaining that I was also a great Ron Turner fan, and I asked him to pass my letter on to John Lawrence. In the letter, I told John that I was also a great fan of Turner, but my interest stemmed from the marvellous covers that Ron had produced in the 1950s for the Sky and Science Fiction paperbacks. John and I promptly began and maintained a regular, enthusiastic contact, helping each other to complete our respective collections of both Turner comics and book covers. I also now realised how I might achieve my old graphic novels ambition. I could once again write graphic novel versions of Fern's best stories, only this time the artwork would be by Turner, thus ensuring the highest professional standards that I could never hope to attain myself. John was also enthused at this prospect, and so he put me in touch with Turner's agent, Greg Hall. To whom I explained that I was now the agent for Mrs. Carrie Fern, the copyright holder of the Skyen books for which Turner had previously painted the covers. I proposed that I would write scripts from Fern's books and magazine stories for Turner to illustrate in comic book form, which Hall could then agent. It seemed a surefire scheme. I'd copied my letter to John, and he and I eagerly awaited Hall's response. To our chagrin, weeks dragged by, and Hall never even replied. I might have been prepared to give up, but John Lawrence wasn't. He persisted and contacted Hall again. John later told me he found Hall to be a very wary character, who seemed convinced that our motives to promote scripts that might be suitable for Ron were simply for our own financial gain. However, John managed to assure him they stem from a genuine desire to see Ron working on mature science fiction strips that really suited his strength. At the time, Ron was turning out war strips and fillers for annuals and specials. This was the sort of thing that Turner was doing. He wasn't doing science fiction. He was doing fillers. For specials. There we see his distinctive artwork. But he wasn't doing any science fiction. His talents were being ignored by the current crop of editors. Hall readily agreed, and so he and John reached a common ground. As proof of his sincerity, John then offered on his behalf to contact editors at IPC, as well as DC Thompson's Marvel and Polystyle, 
along with newspapers. So, at John's invitation, I created an outline for a new newspaper strip character based on Claire Drew, the Emperor of Mars, who had featured in four 1954 novels. John then submitted my outline to several editors, including the Mail on Sunday, and the law summarily ignored, this helped to convince Hall that our motives were genuine. Once Hall had finally accepted that we were campaigning for Ron, he kept in touch with John on a regular basis, keeping him informed of Ron's ongoing situation. Although continued efforts to acquire suitable work for Ron continued without success, John's ultimate aim was to meet Ron Turner and put our proposals to him directly. This had been denied due to Hall's unfounded belief that he might lose control of the situation as Ron's agent. It was only when Hall began suffering from severe ill health in 1984 and chose to retire, prompting Ron Turner to follow him into retirement, that John was finally allowed to meet Turner. He offered to act as Ron's agent, promising him a continuous stream of work. John explained to Turner that top quality scripts for new comic strips would be assured as I now held the copyrights on all Fern stories, these having been bequeathed to me in Mrs Fern's 1982 will. The prospect of working at his own pace in illustrating Fern stories again appealed to Ron immensely and so he appointed John as his new agent. John agreed a very reasonable professional page rate for Turner's artwork the cost of which we agreed to split between us. We also agreed to form a partnership, GRF Enterprises, to help bring it about. But it looked as if we would need to self-publish in order to get started. Our comic could feature one-off stories selected from Fern's many short stories and novelettes. The first story I scripted was an adaptation of Whispering Satellite a short story that had appeared in Astounding Stories in January 1938. Whilst John liked the story, he suggested that I should consider creating a new continuing character modelled on Rick Random, the super detective strip for which Turner was best known. John wanted a character based on Turner's greatest success at random. But for my part, I was more in favour of creating a character on the lines of Dan Dare, who would be my own childhood favourite. So eventually we devised a new space hero, Nick Hazard, interstellar agent, who was an amalgamation of the two. I could still follow my original idea of adapting a Fern Pult story by rewriting it to feature Nick Hazard rather than its original hero. We submitted our ideas to Ron Turner, who produced some great sketches of how he visualised Howard. And this is what developed. is created by Ron Turner. So in 1985, John and I had agreed to jointly finance and produce a quarterly comic book, GRF Presents, which would feature the serialised adventure of Nick Hazard, with a backup feature of classic reprints of Turner's own character, Spaceus. Classic reprints of the Spaceus stories from the 1950s.
I would write the new material which John would pass to Turner to draw and John would also select and reprint select the reprints of Spaces and also handle the production of the magazine. We set to work with great enthusiasm and what happened next will be featured in my coming videos. In the meantime, here's just a sneak peek at some of what we produced.